If you just want an amplifier, no features, just the amp, but well built with good quality parts, how little can you get away with spending? My answer would traditionally be £349, a little less when the Cambridge Audio AXA35 goes on sale. It's a great amplifier with a warm, rich sound based around the Texas Instruments LM3886 chip. Don't turn your nose up just yet. These chip-based amplifier modules have come a long way in recent years. Not only do they offer great measured performance, they're far from those thin, harsh-sounding Class D amplifiers of the past, and they find themselves in more expensive amplifiers than the AXA35. The Arcam SA10 retails for £735 and uses exactly the same chip, but also has a very good internal DAC, allowing you to connect your streamer, CD transport, and other digital sources without shelling out for an external box. A lot depends on the quality of the power supply. Chip-based amplifiers can actually have an advantage over traditional Class AB designs, as long as the money saved from the lower parts bill goes into a better quality power supply. Now, if you don't need a built-in DAC, phono stage, multiple inputs, and a remote control, all you want is one input and a volume control. How little can you get away with spending? 100 pounds, perhaps a little bit more? Well, a lot of people who buy IEMA and Fozzy Audio products seem to think so, and I had to find out for myself. The Fozzy Audio V3 retails for a penny under £100, sold via Amazon and AliExpress. That's for the standard 32 volt power supply. You pay extra for the 48 volt power supply that I have, which I anticipate will be around £50. Forget the website rating of 300 watts per channel into 4 ohms, I don't know where they arrive at those figures. In real world applications you're looking at a similar ability to drive speakers as the Cambridge Audio AXA35, which is sensibly rated at 35 watts per channel into 8 ohms. It's certainly more powerful than the tiny 107 by 37 by 143 mm case would suggest. That's only 4.2 by 1.5 by 5.6 inches. It's not much bigger than the palm of my hand and makes a discreet desktop solution. I'm hugely impressed with the build quality and finish. An all aluminium black case with a 5 mm thick front plate, details like no visible screws, understated branding, the radial design of the ventilation holes on the top plate and rounded edges impart a simple elegance. Even the knob to switch on and control attenuation on the V3 is metal. The copper colour adds a bit of welcome drama, but there's a black dial included in the box to satisfy more conservative types. The rear has just one line level input and a 3.5mm pre-out for bi-amping or connecting a powered subwoofer. Naturally, the speaker binding posts are going to be fairly close together, so banana plugs rather than spade connectors are the way to go. The inside of the V3 is pretty impressive, so let's start with where the power comes in. And here we have a thermistor from NTC, uh, effectively is a current limiting device. It gives this unit a soft startup, so you don't get a thud through your speakers when you first power it up. And I'm sure there's some filtration on the power supply itself, but we have some additional filtration here, provided by two NCC capacitors, good quality Japanese caps. Each one's rated at 2200 microfarads, one per channel and it's supported by four Wima Audio caps. Wima Audio is a top quality German brand and two Sumida Audio inductors. Again, another good quality Japanese part. This is the input stage, and we have an A tapered volume pot as opposed to a linear one. And that means that you can make finer adjustments in the volume more easily because that's more in line with how we hear things. And then the coupling capacitors, there's a bunch of them here, those electrolytic capacitors are provided by Elna, another top quality Japanese brand. And you have some gain provided by these op amps on the input stage. And those are from Texas Instruments. They're the NE5532s, but they can actually be swapped out. If you're careful, you can actually take those out and put other ones in. Something called op amp rolling, a bit like tube rolling. Something that people like to do in order to change the sound. I flip the circuit board and casework around so you can see the other side. And one thing that you can't see because they're underneath this heatsink are the two power amplifier modules. The Texas Instruments TPA3255s 
are extremely well regarded at these lower price points. And they've been mounted on this side to keep away from the capacitors. Even class D amplifiers can get hot when driven hard and electrolytic capacitors do not like heat. The electrolyte will naturally dry out over time, values will drift and ultimately they will fail. So heating them up just makes that problem worse and happen sooner. So this should help to improve the long-term reliability of this device. And the heatsink itself is mounted to the casework and that's why you have these ventilation holes. The improved thermal efficiency, thermodynamic efficiency I should say, helps this amplifier to be driven harder for longer with lower distortion and again improves the longevity of this device. This little box is magic. My experiences of little class D amplifiers in the past has not been pleasant, brittle, harsh sounding devices that are best avoided until you can stump up for a proper amplifier. I can appreciate the phenomenal bass control and excellent levels of detail delivered by more expensive Class D offerings, but they seem to suck the life out of the mid-range, stripping out harmonics. For 100 to 150 pounds, I'm not expecting to hear those little micro details and subtle timbral inflections in the music. I just want the fundamentals of sound quality to be in place, and this fuzzy audio amplifier delivers. Perhaps its most remarkable quality is how free it is from coloration, and in this regard, it's reminiscent of a Hegel amplifier. Now, I'm not hyping this up. I'm not saying it has anywhere the ability to drive speakers, deliver the level of scale, dynamics, or detail of a 1500 pound Hegel H95. What I'm referring to is the V3's ability to get out of the way of the music, the way in which a Hegel does, without imposing any character or prioritizing any particular part of the frequency range. And it manages to pull this off without sounding dry or boring in the process. The Fozzy Audio V3 does what good Class D amplifiers should do. Bass is well controlled, not the one note plod along affair that you get from many amplifiers in this class. The lack of smearing in the mid-range means that you can hear the main performers in the mix nicely separated out, as are cymbal hits and other high frequency details. The soundstage is pretty much between the speakers, daring to venture out with the most spatial recordings, but I'm not complaining, especially when there's reasonable placement of performers within the mix. But the timing accuracy to deliver more elusive qualities such as soundstage depth and lockdown imaging understandably remain beyond the V3. You get more of that open, defined listening experience from the Cambridge Audio AXA35, which is unquestionably a better amplifier. The landscape has a bigger presentation and there's more dynamic contrast due to less effort required to shift in volume. I generally preferred the Fosse Audio V3 over the much more expensive SMSL VMV A1. The Class A amplifier has a similar sense of scale, but not quite the bass control of the V1, although sometimes I appreciated the A1's richer tone. The V3 has less coloration than the IOTA VX SA3 with its more obvious boosted bass and treble, but in all other aspects, the SA3 pulls ahead. It's the most dynamic amplifier in this bunch and will drive trickier speakers. Let's get the obvious out of the way. The Fozzy Audio V3 is effectively a power amplifier with a volume control. No tone controls, no remote control, and just the one input. So if you want more functionality, I can't see the point in shelling out for a separate preamplifier. Just go for something like the Cambridge Audio AXA35. I think the V3 is more likely to be used in a single source system. It could be an entry level turntable with a built in phono stage like the Project E1. At £229, it's plug and play, and for less than £400, you have a just add speakers, great vinyl solution. On the digital end, something like a Win Mini Pro that sells for £149 will let you stream via Spotify, Tidal or Amazon Music. You can send music to it from your iPhone, courtesy of AirPlay 2, or your Android phone via Google Chromecast, even connect a TV to the Win Mini Pro's Spidiff input. As for speakers, I'd expect the V3 to work well with a wide variety of price appropriate speakers because of the lack of coloration. And designers of speakers at the lower price point generally make them easy to drive because they know that the accompanying amplification is likely to have limited current capability. Of the sub 300 pound speakers out there, there are plenty of options, but I have three favorites that I'm happy to share. Now I should point out, 
that these are just merely suggestions because I don't have these speakers here. I've heard them many times over the years. The speakers that I tried were more expensive. Anyway, for what it's worth, this is my shortlist. The Acoustic Energy A100 Mark II's retail for £259. They're clean, dynamic speakers with great mid-range tone and plenty of detail. The Q Acoustics 3020i's are £249. Expect a little bit more bass energy than what you get from the A100's, but not the articulation in the mid-range and upper frequencies. If you want a natural sounding mid-range, then check out the Dali Spectre 2's, also £249. They shouldn't be overlooked just because they've been around for a while. The Fozzie Audio V3 has enough quality to live with speakers in the class above, as long as you understand the limitations of what you're working with. As I mentioned earlier, forget what the specs say. 300 watts per channel into 4 ohms is just ridiculous. The reality is that the V3 has a limited current capability, which makes it suitable for a desktop solution or a small room application. Unless you're driving really sensitive horn-loaded speakers, which are likely to cost thousands, and then my question would be, why would you choose a 100 pound or 150 pound amplifier? The V3 worked great with the Sound Artist LS35A in the near field. Keeping within two meters, six and a half feet of them, allowed me to experience the clarity and mid-range magic of this little monitor. Further away, and there was a steep descent into them sounding flat and soft. The limits in driving capability were even more present with the ELAC Unify Reference UBR62s. The V3 did okay at moderate volumes, but you really need something with a bit more oomph to keep those larger woofers in check. My favourite pairing with this pencil case sized fuzzy amp was the new Q Acoustics 5020s, detailed, dynamic with a good tonal balance, as long as you don't go much beyond 80 decibels and remain within 3 meters 10 feet of the speakers, they sounded great. What an age of hi-fi we live in. For 100 to 150 pounds, you can get this level of sonic performance. The Fozzy Audio V3 looks a quality product from the outside, thanks to its all aluminum casework and understated styling. But the real quality is on the inside where Fozzy Audio have made some really smart choices, opting for minimal top quality parts that will leave many designers of more exotic gear scratching their heads. Some people are going to take issue with the lack of features, no remote control, no tone controls, and just the one input. And if that's you, there's other options out there. Heck, Fozzy Audio offers those options. But that isn't the point of this device. It's a discrete amplifier that's designed to form part of a desktop or small room system, offering exceptional sound quality in the process. The Fozzy Audio V3 amplifier gets an outstanding from this channel. I'm probably a bit of a hi-fi purist. I can live without a remote control and amplifier. I do live without tone controls. I only want the inputs that I'm gonna use, but that's just me. Others are different, and as they say, variety is the spice of life. So let's have that discussion in the comments section. What features do you think are essential, and which ones can you easily live without? All I remind people to do is to be respectful of other people's opinions. I'm sure I don't have to say that, but I already have. Anyway, all that remains for me to say is if you like what I'm doing with this channel and you want to see it grow, please like, share, subscribe, hit the bell notification if you haven't done so already. Check me out on Patreon for consultancy services. There's a couple of tiers there that you can access if you think I can help you on your audiophile journey. Also check out the ABA Club on Patreon, which is a great way to interact with me and other Patreons. But for today, for now, a British audiophile, signing off.